And that heat is actually very important in the universe because we have these cold clouds of hydrogen gas floating around in the universe. These clouds would be doing absolutely nothing and having no e emission of energy or signal of any kind, except the cosmic microwave background warms them up just enough that once every 10 to 20 million years on average, a hydrogen atom floating around in space will do a spin flip and release one single photon of radio wave emission at a wavelength of 21, 21 centimeters. centimeters. And so that- and that means what? <laughs> it's like, look, the two of them is just like, one photon. <laughs> and it releases at, and Neil is just like, 21 centimeters. <laughs> It's the, what the hell are you talking about? It's the best inside joke in the universe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See, we tried hard not to laugh during that time. But, but as, as Neil can explain better than I can, because this is actually part of the area of research he was doing more than I was, 21 centimeter radiation is what tells us where the hydrogen material is in the universe and how it's moving to make new stars. Ah, new planets and okay. new galaxies in the universe. So the excitation of these clouds. That's the right word too, yeah. What? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. That alone, is it now a chain reaction? Yes. Okay. You create that bath of three degree Kelvin cosmic microwave background photons, which in a turn causes these gas clouds to do something. And that allows us as astronomers to figure out how the universe is aging and what its processes are going on billions of light years away. But just to put this to bed, if absolute zero is the coldest possible temperature, then you need something to draw the heat away from what's there. And as you do that, it's still kind of in contact with what's doing the drawing of the heat. So, in principle, it may be physically impossible to reach absolute zero because it's always, like you said, it will always be in contact with something that's not absolute zero. Gotcha. Because otherwise everything is absolute zero and right. it's not. Right. Okay? There's some enclosure. So, no matter how good your Yeti <laughs> is, okay? <laughs> your Stanley Cup. <laughs> All right? No matter how good it is, the ice in there eventually melts. Right. right. Okay? Because there's heat transfer, however slow, it's not a perfectly, it's, if it were perfectly insulated, it would never melt. That's right. But that's not how the actual world works. That's right. So even without quantum effects, you will wind up with thermodynamic losses. But even at absolute zero, we're now pretty sure that there are quantum fluctuations. The quantum. That, yes. But, but so what about the, the superheroes that can that breathe fire or something, or, ah. or, or whatever, they make fire. They're called dragons. You mean like Godzilla or something? Well, I don't know, any of any of the ones that... Or when Superman burps. <laughs> oh, we're back, we're back there with it. Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm just wondering, thermodynamically, Yes. the fire has energy, so that energy ah. has to come from within. Yes. Torch. Fantastic Four. Torch. Yes, yeah, okay. the Human Fantastic Torch in the Fantastic Four supposedly is able to convert chemically like fire is basically a chemical reaction, right? Uh, uh, something like a, a nuclear detonation or say the interior of the sun, that's a nuclear event. And so somehow that energy gets converted to heat depending on what the processes are in the sun or in the person or in the uh, campfire. Okay, so the fire superheroes don't need quantum effects. For they them. don't. That's a simple right. burning. Yeah. Okay. Even thermodynamics is extremely powerful. A lot of us don't understand just how powerful, but you know how there was this industrial evolution based on the steam engine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just the heat energy in this room right now. Mm. If and you it were is to hot. You people are hot. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to convert that into mechanical energy, you could take an 18-wheeler and drive it right through the wall from that side to that side and all the way out. You have so much kinetic energy from the thermal motions in the air alone that it's easy to see how you can have tremendous superpower even if you don't have quantum power. So coming out of the Industrial Revolution. That's right. Yeah. Let's keep this going with the fact that we know if most of matter is, yes, most of the universe is empty space, and most of matter is empty space on top of that, if you had the power to collapse 
particles down and then re restore them, okay, yeah. you get a smaller version of yourself and then a bigger version of yourself. That's Ant-Man. Exactly. Ah. Ant-Man. Yes. By the way, worst name for a superhero. It is. Ever. It is. <laughs> it is. Really yeah. bad. Well, but he's a pretty powerful guy. But that's the yeah. quantum mechanics. That's exactly the, the quantum mechanics. Mystical pin particle, right? Yes, that's right. They uh, are in... borrowed from another dimension. So are we looking at quantum mechanics being able to enlighten us and our understanding oh, of higher dimensions? What a great question. That's Thank a you. great way to It think. won't happen again. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the the so-called pin particle is a fictional thing invented by uh, Marvel Comics. There's a scientist named Henry Pym, P Y M, and by using these uh, harnessing these particles which are sort of super dimensional, you're able to make things big and small. You're literally in in a sense, taking something like this, making it small, and then making it big, or making it huge, because you're taking advantage of the space in between your molecules and your atoms that we were just talking about. So this fictional yeah. particle is exploiting known physics. That's right. Okay. Yeah, Very but this fictional... But let me ask you, because what you just said, if you keep the same mass... Right. ...and you make me super big, I'm this. I'm the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. That's right. Now. I'm <laughs> a beach ball. Yeah, yeah I'm right. a beach ball. Like. That's right. Yeah. And so therein lies the the extra dimensional part to which mm -hmm. you refer. The only way that these particles can work in our world, you know, as if they were actually in our world, right? But if they were really working, you would have to add mass to things as you were growing them, and you would have to reduce the mass of the things that you were shrinking, right? Otherwise, if you shrunk down your um, vehicle and put it in your pocket so that you could ride it later, you would not be running very fast. It would still weigh thousands of pounds. That's right. In your pocket. Right. So, Just because it fits in your pocket doesn't mean it belongs in your pocket. That's right. Okay. So somehow, <laughs> these pim particles... Yeah. Well, it's kind of deep, actually, no, when saying, I think about it. Just because it... That, oh, that wow. covers so many problems in life. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean it belongs there. Yeah, yeah. Right. I love it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this material, this matter, had to either go into some dimension that doesn't weigh anything in our space-time, or be drawn from somewhere that previously didn't have any weight in our space-time and suddenly becomes having weight. So you're really shunting these things in and ah. out of space-time. Otherwise, you, you, your, pro, your challenge would be the creation and destruction of that, mass correct. in our own space-time. That's right. And we know what happens when that happens. Mm -hmm. That's, those are th nuclear bombs. Right. If you take mass and make it energy, yeah. that's the end of your situation. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know why I got all excited just then. Yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. worries yeah. me, Chuck. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. Okay. It, because nuclear fusion also powers the sun. Yeah. Right? It's a very benign thing. We often think about on our, on our world as being dangerous. But in fact, without it, we wouldn't be here. Okay. We talked about quantum tunneling. Yes. There's another term that comes up. And if I think of a superhero, I go back to Dr. Manhattan. And that's Ooh. the superposition, ah. mm. where I am simultaneously in different parts in any part of wherever I want to be. Yes. And Dr. Manhattan could be in many places at the same yeah. time. He would be on Mars and on the moon and in his laboratory and, you know, uh, all, all at once. Wait, wait, I, is that correct that way? Well, how many it, it of you guys know access. Dr. Manhattan? Well, yeah. yeah, first Dr. Of all, Manhattan. I know we're geeking out here. This has turned into four guys at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Does everybody know who Dr. Manhattan is? Watchmen. Yeah. Watchmen. Watchmen. Dr. Watchmen. Manhattan was created in the Watchmen universe by Alan Moore in the 1980s. Yeah. And this is a superhero which didn't really want to be a superhero. But he's essentially blue, and he's played by Billy Crudup, and he doesn't wear any clothes. And he just sits around in his blue. Is that your most obvious fact about him? Yes. Well, <laughs> the man is the most powerful entity ever created, and he's going to say he doesn't wear clothes. I got to tell you, uh, he looks pretty good naked. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the idea is that he is, by himself, a kind of quantum particle. He uh -huh. has the powers of doing anything that quantum particles can do, but he is the size of a house. And therefore, he house. has an unbelievably large amount of power because he can do all the things that can happen on microscopic scales, but out on the scale of us and, and our size. So for him, his personal quantum constants are just larger. That's right. So it's as if he, George Gamow himself. As we were talking about earlier, yes. he's got a he's Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. That's right. Except he is the Wonderland. That's right. Right. So I don't think it's that he was simultaneously in those places. He's just like a particle 
has a probability it can be found in any one of the places in its, what should we call this? The wave function? The wave function. Well, okay. Anywhere it's wave function. He can say, my wave function includes Mars. I'm going to be on Mars right now. So then he's on Mars. Right. Yeah, and, and he so was. He doesn't actually have to travel there. He doesn't there. travel there. He's already there all the time. All the time. Right, because Correct. he's entangled with himself. Yes. Mm. But is it entanglement or is it manipulation? Great question. Let me try to break that down a little bit, okay? You guys might have heard of quantum entanglement lately. It's in the news. It's very exciting and so forth. But actually, It's not in the Hamptons news. That's a different No? <laughs> it's summer. <laughs> Okay. I heard some people on the beach the other day talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Quantum entanglement is the idea where you can take a particle and literally split it into two identical particles, and they can be as far apart or as old or as new or as kept or as they want, and they will still stay the same particle. Okay. So you And know about each other. That's right. So you have something that could be uh, the size of a solar system. And yet, if you got information on one particle, you would instantaneously get the information on the other particle as if they were entangled. When in fact, in the quantum way of thinking about it, they are still one particle. One particle. They just still happen to be connected as both a particle and a wave that keeps changing size and shape. So you have this particle, and, and we in the classical world think of particles as like a piece of stone or a rock or a, a piece of metal or something, just a particle, right? But in fact, if you think quantumly, the particle and the wave are interconnected. And so the concept of size and the concepts of age right. are very, very different. And as long as you can keep that coherence and make sure that there isn't noise or static that interrupts the connection between these pieces, they are one particle, no matter In fact, how there's far. there's a contest who can create the most distant particle pairs yes. in this exercise. And the leaders in this in the world is China. China has the farthest separated particles. Yes. Not for long. <laughs> I'm here to say that I'm going to take care of this two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> and China, China will lose. <laughs> so so okay. it's a contest. We don't know. It's like, it, it's like an arms race, but we don't know why. Yeah. Uh, we, what good is it? Right. At this moment, Physicists are still trying to figure out whether entanglement is a perfectly normal thing that happens all the time. All the we just time. never noticed it. Right. Or whether it's actually something profound that can be used in a way, for example, for instantaneous communications or other kinds of storage of information and so on. What we do know is that if you entangle some things, you can create this thing called a qubit which is a piece of information that's not just one or zero that we use on our current computers. Which but, are called bits. That's right, they're called bits. But these qubits can take positions between zero and one, doing strange things in between until such time as you read them out as a zero or a one. Okay, this is a very odd concept in our heads, but what it is, it means that we as particles or conglomerations of particles could in fact communicate or otherwise interact as waveforms of energy in ways that we can't imagine now, but might be able, for example, to break computer codes instantaneously or allow us to do in kinds of computations or communications. It's the future of quantum computing. Of. That's yeah. right. Very, very We're on possible. the doorstep of this. The doorstep of it. We're way, 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 well, the door's very thick. Okay. <laughs> but, but we are at the doorstep, yes. So what you're describing is the, I guess the, in the lingo, the collapse of the wave function because the particles are waves, the waves are particles, but when it's manifesting as a wave, the wave occupies all the space that you're describing. When we think of particles, it's here or there. The wave is, whatever you calculate the extent of the wave to be, the particle can manifest at any point within that volume. And so then you collapse the wave function. Bing. There it is. Then there's the particle over here. So this, so Dr. Manhattan would collapse his own wave function. And he'd go up on there, Mars. On the collapse moon. it again, and he's back here. Yeah. Right. That's wild. Right. That's yeah. the manipulation. 